It all started innocently enough. The task said, draw a face. Surely my three-year-old could do this. A simple circle, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. We'd watched Baby Newton and learnt how to draw shapes. We'd listened to Baby Mozart, so I knew he could concentrate. And we'd read so many books with faces in them. Surely my three-year-old could do this simple task. When children are first born, they're given something called an APGAR test, and it tests a baby's reactions 30 seconds after they're born. My son scored three out of 10. I was devastated. There was no way I was going to allow my son to get three out of 10 again. So I coached him through the task. And not happy after the 10th attempt, I, as his mother, then decided to add a set of eyebrows to the drawing. A drawing supposedly done by my son to be taken to his nursery assessment. And I wanted him to be seen for the bright, curious and creative child that he was. And surely a more accurate representation of a face would allow him to gain a place at this prestigious nursery. Or had I just allowed my son to not develop grit and not to experience failure? There it is. That word we find so unpalatable, so distinctly uncomfortable, that we use as many synonyms as we can to disguise the less than perfectness of ourselves and our children. And we need to get better at it. Generation Z, millennials, snowflakes, they all come under such scrutiny and are generally found to be coming up wanting. Have we inadvertently, through our desire to nurture and protect, instead raised a generation of young people who do not have the tools to face fear, failure and hard work? During the 80s and 90s, schooling ensured that basic participation was celebrated, with nobody being allowed to win and nobody being allowed to lose. Has today's overprotective, failure-avoiding parenting undermined the confidence, intelligence and academic potential of an entire generation? Even the production of Velcro shoes and clip-on ties means that our children can't even fail at getting dressed in the morning. Rebecca's example of her son's nursery masterpiece is by no means an isolated incident. Some of you may remember the actress Felicity Huffman paying $15,000 to fix her daughter's college exam. Whilst very few parents would ever be in the financial bracket to do this, how many wish they could? How many have offered to run the PTA or make all the costumes in the school play in the hope of their child being treated favourably? Huffman defended her actions by stating, in my desire to be a good parent, I talked myself into thinking that all I was doing was giving my daughter a fair shot. Fair is an unfortunate word to use here, for it is by no means fair. But was she right in trying to shield her from knowing that her maths just wasn't up to scratch? This is a great example of snowplow parenting. Yet it backfired enormously, with nobody winning, least of all her daughter. There are many approaches to modern parenting. For example, helicopter parenting. Hovering above your child, waiting for any failure to loom, whereupon you swoop down like a paratrooper behind enemy lines. Or lawnmower parenting, cropping down any risk of disappointment in their path. The most recent one we heard of was the curling approach, frantically smoothing the ice, removing any friction long before your child gets there. Whilst all of these are undoubtedly rooted in love, you are, in fact, only delaying the inevitable. But worse than this, you are preventing your child from experiencing and learning from failure. A recent research project entitled Understanding Resilience made the analogy to the immune system explicit. Stress inoculation is a form of immunity against later stressors, much in the same way that vaccines induce immunity against disease. If we were to remove these small but highly formative experiences, what would the impact be? Interestingly, it would seem that Generation Z has a slightly different perspective than their millennial predecessors. Rather than helicopters, modern-day parents are more like stealth fighters, monitoring their child's activity, movements and communication, dropping bombs and redirecting as necessary, but just as quickly zipping back out again. 
At a recent meeting of head teachers, I heard the story of a family that had given a major donation to a school when their child started there in year seven. The school clearly accepted this donation, only to find that four years later, the same parents demanded that their son became the leader of the orchestra. And surely he should be given this accolade because they had donated so liberally. Even if he wasn't the natural leader of the orchestra or even the best musician in the school. Modern day parenting is dictated by fear. Risks seem to lie around every corner antibiotic resistant germs, unfair teachers, bullying children. So that when we tuck our children into bed at night, free from cuts, bruises, and emotional hurt, we have for one more day found tangible evidence of our parenting success. Maybe tomorrow I'll let my child walk to school by themselves, we tell ourselves. But for today, with my help, my child has got to school safely. Maybe tomorrow my child will be able to do their homework by themselves. But for today, with my help, they are successful in maths. Maybe tomorrow continues until it's time for the child to leave home, by which time they know that as parents, we will always be there to save them from themselves. We stand here as educators, as daughters, and one of us as a mother, to advocate a new approach. Trampoline parenting. We bounce our children up, up into the world, where they have room to grow, think and experiment. But we remain there beneath them, so that when they inevitably fall back down, we're then there to wrap around them and chuck them back up to where they were before. You always remain there as a safety net, but each time they bounce a little higher, travel further and go that little bit more confidently. This metaphor transcends mother to son, father to daughter, but to all of us as a society. Whether we be bosses, mentors, teachers or parents, we all have a responsibility to give them the tools to fly and then let them go. You have to be bold to let them go, but you always remain there to pick them back up when they fall. It is only when we do this as standard that we will have a future workforce who can go out into the world as robust, resilient and confident young people ready to contribute to society in all the ways that we need them to. Acceptance and the experience of failure is not new in schools. The work of Carol Dweck and her concept of growth mindset is prevalent. The children most open to failure in schools are those that are found in the nursery and reception classes. People joke about toddlers and their myriad of questions and their ability to throw themselves into any mess or situation. Why? Because they are on a fast trajectory for learning. They know that to learn, they have to try and they have to fail. It's only when children become older that this appears to become a barrier to their learning. So what is going on outside the safety of the classroom? Could it be that beyond the school gates, failure is still seen to be such an abhorrent concept that it must be avoided at all costs? If it takes a village to raise a child, and indeed an entire generation, then do we need to be rethinking the concept of failure? We believe the time has come to redress the balance and make a plea that children are given the time and space to fail forward, fail well and fail often. But for this to be the case, we all need to be on the same page. So stop snowplow parenting and let your children develop the grit and resilience that they so badly need in order to flourish. Let's hear now from some children about what they have learnt from their own failure. I didn't give up, never give up. It doesn't really matter if you fail as long as you try your hardest every single time. I learned that we're not perfect and we won't always win. In retrospect, I think failure is a very important thing to know what happiness is and what doing well and being successful is. So you need to fail to be successful. For an effective upbringing, schools need to work in partnership with parents. We have to trust each other, and we have to agree in the nicest possible way it is not about us, but it is about the young people we serve. Children need to find things hard, they need to make mistakes, and they need to fail. 
If they do something wrong, they need to try to learn to find a different approach. If they do something unkind, they need to reflect on what they did and what the outcome was. If they are physical with another child, they need to learn that there will be consequences from doing this. As educators, we can also be accused of fueling the failure flame. More recently, schools have introduced a homework app which allows pupils, but more importantly here, parents, to see their child's homework as it appears online. At a recent Year 9 parents' evening, a mother actually claimed that the app was distracting her from her working day. She was finding herself starting her daughter's homework as it appears. <laughs> Researching historical data, starting graphs, and she'd even built a volcano cake for her daughter's geography project before her daughter had even come home from school. How many of us here can be accused of actually helping or doing our child's homework? In all honesty, hands up. <laughs> in a previous school I worked in, I set a project-based task to build an Anderson shelter. A boy in my class had absolutely no intention whatsoever of completing this task, so his father decided to do it instead. In all honesty, it was a first-rate Anderson shelter. <laughs> delivered to my classroom with great pomp and circumstance. However, in all seriousness, this taught his son nothing apart from two key lessons. If you don't value a task or job, don't bother doing it. And if you don't do it, I will do it for you. In fact, research would suggest that we are actually failing our children by not allowing them opportunities to struggle. An international study of math teaching in Japan found that teachers there put their children into what is known as the learning pit almost 50% of the time. These are opportunities to be able to think outside of the box and experience failure in the classroom. Interestingly, this is seen only 1% of the time in British and American classrooms. This is because as teachers and educators, we jump in, show them the way to ensure that our children don't struggle. This is nearly always because this new science of falling into the learning pit is not widely understood and we are culturally trained to jump in and help our children to save them from the struggle, when in fact this is the last thing that we should be doing. The one thing we all have in common is that we were put here by our parents. Our parents have shaped who we are and how we think. How many times have you heard yourself sounding just like your mother? Much of the time this is obvious to us, sometimes painfully so. But does our unconscious bias come from how we were raised? Take my well-meaning father, for instance. After a particularly long and tortuous homework session on long division, in the loving hope of making me feel better, he proclaimed, you are a Stuart. Stuarts are bad at maths. <laughs> Sorry, Bobby, I heard your speech earlier. <laughs> he said this in the loving hope of making me feel better about this relentless, ongoing mathematical failure. But did it, in fact, just reinforce my belief that I would never be good at maths? Rather than learn to persevere, I gave up, got a tutor, and I got by at best. It is safe to say I have never flourished mathematically. As we saw from the Huffman example, parents will try to do anything they can to ensure that their child doesn't experience failure. And this is nearly always in the arguably misguided hope of saving their feelings. But when do we as parents plan to stop? When a child leaves primary school, evidence would suggest not. When they transition from further to higher education, perhaps. We would like to think that this would no longer be an issue by the time the child moves into full-time employment. We once knew of a girl who was naive in her use of social media, sharing a photograph of herself that cast her in a less than positive light. Rather than support the school's challenge of this behaviour, the parents pushed back, claiming that her, their daughter had been sanctioned unfairly and that no more should be said on the matter. We couldn't help but be frustrated by this approach. Rather than allow the situation to become a learning curve, it very quickly became a matter of school versus parents. We need to work much harder on a school-parent relationship that allows us to support our children when they do make mistakes. 
Data collected for this talk indicates that children do have a real fear of failure. From over 1,000 4 to 18-year-olds polled from both independent schools and academies, it would appear, appear that only 10% of children never fear failure. 20% of children actually have a constant aversion to failure, and this is having a negative impact on their learning. So what does this tell us? It tells us, it asks the question, how are we bringing up our children? And do we actually impart our own fear of failure onto our children? And are we fueling their fear of failure? Look at Clemmie's fear of maths and how this was reinforced by her parents in what they felt was a supportive way. Given that the data also suggests over 60% of children do learn from their mistakes, shouldn't we therefore be giving them many more opportunities to do just that? Let them fail a maths test and learn from their mistakes. Let them be dropped from the hockey team. Let them not become a prefect. Sometimes we have to accept that our children just aren't good enough. Yet. The one-shot approach to GCSEs and A-levels perpetuates this fear, and it would take a bold teacher or parent to stand up to the system. However, society is changing, and our children won't be going into just one career, but many. And for some 30%, they'll be becoming their own bosses. So we think that time has come for failure to become an acceptable part of growing up. So when you all go home tonight, why not try just one of the following? Firstly, please try to worry less about your children. Then let them struggle with the homework without jumping in to save them. Let them pack their PE kit, and if they forget their socks, they'll learn from it. Let them fall out with their friends, but crucially here, learn to renegotiate those friendships for themselves. The work of raising a resourceful adult takes time, but it begins with a simple equation. We need to give our children autonomy, allow them to feel competent and confident, and support them as they grow. This begins the moment a baby fails to grasp a toy, or as a toddler falls as they move across the room, and continues until they move out into their adult lives. The sooner parents can learn to appreciate the positive aspects of hardship and allow their children to benefit from the upside of failure, the sooner all of us can share in moments of joy and pride. Like the joy I saw on my son's face when asked at his nursery assessment to draw the face again all by himself. <laughs> he drew an almost perfect circle, two eyes, and a mouth. He did miss out the nose. <laughs> Meanwhile, the one we had so carefully prepared at home was filed away in a drawer, never to be seen again. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, good.